and we are live so yeah give it a few minutes because like people won't even have got the messages yet so <laughs> yeah. yeah we'll see hi everybody <laughs> hi um russell for now right and eventually well, hi everybody that's watching later on <laughs> well five people have joined already so that's good All that's right. a good start five more of them are active in the sidekick traders today that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> or Theo for that matter but, yeah hey guys how's it going I uh, mentioned in the comments say hello um, we're hoping to do like a question and answer part of this as well like we're going to go through some of what uh, Lance basically does a lot of which is longer term investing so hopefully we can uh, have a productive evening um, so yeah don't be shy say hello in the comments we're gonna have loads of times for questions so like Probably gonna like pause. What was it? Every few slides. Yeah, Lance? I purpose I purposely set it up where every about two to three slides we'll leave it open for, for questions. So I'll just right. cover a small topic there, answer whatever questions you have, and then just keep moving on. Yeah, sounds good. Um, yeah, do you want to put your slides up then, and we can kind of sure. share them and kind of get going in a few minutes? But. But you guys want to stick around to the end because we're going to talk about at least one idea that you're obsessed with, right, Lance, that you're really uh, putting money into for the coming year Yeah. Um, for dividend stocks. So. All right. Do you see the buy and hold webinar slide? I do. Uh, hi, Carrie. How's it going? Good to see you. People starting to say hello in the comments. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, I can't. I can't see. I just have the full screen on the presentation. I don't know if you can see my face too. But, uh. <laughs> I, yep. So at the moment we've got just me and you plus the slides. But like once we get started in a couple of minutes, I'll put just the whole slides up because they don't need to see us when we're. <laughs> yeah. Slides, right? You don't have to see my my receding hairline that much. Right? <laughs> <laughs> sometimes the slides are just like you can't quite see things so we'll try and get it full screen um, yeah Carrie's saying life is pretty good yeah cool yeah. yeah so let's um yeah let's just get going because um it's been a really quiet quiet few days i think um most people are probably going to be watching the replay of this just because it's uh the day before like new year's eve right so yeah. <laughs> Um, this is the week that doesn't exist. That's what somebody <laughs> told me. Uh, the week between Christmas and New Year. So I thought we'd do this presentation and then um, give some other information on some ways that like Lance is offering to do some like mentoring and, and, and sort of like stock picking for the longer term uh, new service that he's launching. So you guys might be interested in learning more about that as well. So, oh, and plus we're probably going to bring back the deal for Theta Traders as well, um, just for uh -huh. tonight the one year uh, special New Year's discount for theater traders yearly. So if you're in theater traders, you might want to jump on that if you're still just doing like month to month or whatever. And if you're not, you might want to take the chance to jump on the uh, the deal. So anyway, let's get started with the webinar. I'm going to put it on full screen and I'll let Lance kind of get started and I'll try and field questions as we go um, in the comments. Right? <laughs> so, sounds good. Yeah, I did leave more breaks than normal. Um, this is probably one half of what I want to fully, you know, divulge. So we might meet again in a few weeks in case um, anyone else has any more clarifying questions afterwards, especially if you're not watching live. So uh, I'm going over about a third to a half of what I'm actually going to cover in my newsletter. So just an FYI on that. All right. So let's get right to it here. So in general, why is buy and hold a pretty viable strategy? Okay. So with proper investing, it does offer a very high probability to build wealth and retire, okay? Stock market is, you know, long trend is upward, as you'll see in a lot of the charts that I'm going to go over. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. A lot of times just simply buy good stocks, hold them for years or decades even, and then just gain with the company and gain with the economic growth of the United States or even the world, right? Um, buy and hold could be a very simple strategy. And in my newsletter, I'm going to go over the absolute simplest bare bones, what you could do. It might take up to an hour to research, but then literally 15 minutes a year to manage it. And you could set it up where it's automatic contributions from your paycheck. That's how I do mine. And for instance, my Roth IRA, I get paid on the 15th of the month On the 16th of the month. It goes into these automatic buy and holds. 
So I don't even need to even look at the accounts. And sometimes I don't even look at the account for months. I'm just going to know that the long term is going to end up being good. And you could grow your net worth, again, along with the strongest companies in the U.S. and abroad. As you own stock, you're a part owner of the company. If the company, again, in the long term here, we're not talking swing trades or daily trades, anything like that. But in the long term, if a company continues to be making profits, they use those profits effectively to grow profits even more, you're going to be a net beneficiary of those companies as well. Okay? Just wanted to go over before looking at different strategies. How do you become wealthy? I wanted to narrow it down to one equation. And that's just wealth is equal to the assets that you're bringing in minus the liabilities or expenses that you have. And then do something effective with the difference of those two, right? So assets, that's money that you're bringing in, right? It could be a paychecks, could be businesses that you're running, uh, money that's just coming in month after month. The liabilities are your expenses that you have. You know, obviously there's some needs that you have, like a house, um, possibly car, food, stuff like that. There might be some other um, non-essential liabilities, like going out to eat every day instead of cooking. So if you change this equation by either making more money or spending less, and ideally, possibly both, then you should be wealthy, right? I mean, it's all about the difference that you're bringing in minus your, your, your spending, right? So what we're going to go over is how to actually use this difference when you have a good amount of money coming in or you're spending very, very little and then using that difference effectively, okay? So where are some good places that you could place this difference from your income minus your expenses? The stock market is a great place in the very long term to grow your wealth and it actually beats inflation. So that naggy inflation that's starting to get really big in the last few months was at five, 6% in the um, consumer price index, right? If you just leave your money under a mattress, you might be having a huge difference from your income minus expenses, but if it's not growing from there, you could actually lose money due to inflation. Things cost more, right? So you want to come up with a plan to at least slightly beat out inflation. And the stock market in the very long run is one of the best, if not the best way to actually beat out inflation. Okay? Um, there are specific companies called REITs, which are real estate investment trusts. And they do invest in real estate. Real estate is another way that a lot of people become wealthy. Um, I don't personally want to own 20 houses and then landlord and look for tenants and all that. But what you can do is buy REITs, which is this type of stock that they do that for you. They're literally buying houses, buying commercial properties. For instance, Walmart, Home Depot, these big companies, they typically lease out their big stores and warehouses. And then you could literally own the property, collect those rent payments, and do all that stuff through the stock company. Again, you don't have to do very much on your own trying to buy and flip houses and whatnot. Another way is bonds. Bonds do help preserve wealth in terms of your buying power usually stays pretty close to what inflation is. And it does help lower your volatility, which is the dramatic swings you might have in your net worth during downturns. I'm going to leave it up for any questions. If anyone in the chat has any general questions on just general wealth and assets liabilities. Yeah, so I just put one up there. Do you see it from Kerry? I don't see the questions. I'll have to move it out of the way. Yeah. Uh, it pops up on the screen so the viewers can <laughs> see it. But... All right, okay. that doesn't work at all. Okay. Yeah, go back to your slides. I'll just read them out for you. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's going to be like the never-ending mirror of like 50 slides. If you could just say them out, please, Russell, that'll be great. All right, yeah. So the first question from uh, Carrie is, do you like baby bonds? Do I like baby bonds? Yeah. Or maybe bonds? <laughs> so he's also saying, whoa, I think he got um, sucked into the vortex there with the uh... – <laughs> there are different, um, different types of bonds that are good. Um, I, I wasn't actually going to focus on bonds in this presentation. We can maybe meet again in a few weeks about it. But I personally don't have any in bonds, but I am a school teacher. And I am going to be getting a pension from my school teaching position eventually when I retire. So I consider that almost like a bond fund. It's really almost like an annuity that I'm getting. But for many people that are cl close to retirement or at retirement, you should have some percent of your allocation in bonds, I think. 
So the one thing I've always looked at is municipal bonds. Like, I don't know if anybody watching has um, actually tried any of them. Do you know much about municipal bonds, Lance? I know. Uh, Again, consult your CPA from what I'm about to say, because I may not be 100% right on the taxes on it, but I'm pretty sure that they're exempt from federal and possibly state income tax. Right. So if you're in a very high net worth and you don't want to pay huge you know, capital gains or income tax, even though the municipal bonds might give a pretty low rate of return, if you're not going to be taxed on it, it could actually be a pretty viable product. But in general, it seems like for it's only useful for very high net worth individuals that are in a very high tax bracket. Yeah. Let me just put a link to some stuff in the, uh, the, the chat there because we weren't going to talk much about bonds, but there's a link going up in the chat now if anybody else is... Not really sure what a municipal bond is or, or you know, that type of thing. So, um, yeah. So, you want to keep going? I don't think All there's right. – hang on. There's another carry saying they're usually $25 per share traded like stocks. So, that's outside your realm of expertise, right? It sounds like um, really. So. Um, <laughs> there there's some bonds that are actually from uh, companies that I've seen that are essentially just lending out money to others where it's um, – like a good faith that you're going to pay it back or something like that. But I've never actually done those. Um, if you're the simplest answer for bonds is you could just do a bonds ETF that usually is intermediate in term. So you don't get hurt too much if the interest rates change dramatically. Um, if you go long-term bonds, you're not going to get a very good rate. And if interest rates go up, it could actually hurt you a little bit and short-term bonds really don't pay much at all. So intermediate is usually the way to go on the bond aspect. Okay, cool. Um, well, let's crack on. I don't see any other questions. So, All right. more. so again, I just wanted to re- reiterate how the stock market is a great provider of wealth if you're willing to buy and hold it, right? This is the S&P 500 chart from around 1980 or so to today. Even the best companies in the world could lose significant amount of money in the short term. Some of you guys might be aware if you're doing trading, you know, trading for weeks or even a month or two out, you know, even the best companies in the world could go down 30, 40% in a month, right? But in the very, very long term, the U.S. stock market is one of the best places to build your wealth, right? So if you can see around 1987, S&P 500 was in the like low 50s, 60s. And as of November, it's 4701. Obviously, you see some dips, uh, 2008 crisis, um, COVID right here. But again, if you bought way back in the day and literally just hold SPY, which is the S&P 500 index fund, I think you do pretty well in the last 40 years, right? (laughs) Yeah. So what do you do when there's short-term blips in the radar? What you do is called dollar cost averaging. So if you put regular contributions, say you're putting in money into that S&P 500 every paycheck, every month or whatnot, you're going to be buying more shares when stocks are cheaper. And that could actually amplify returns compared to putting all your money in at one time. Just imagine if you had every single dollar of your net worth into the S&P 500 right before COVID hit, you would have had a pretty big downturn in just a few months. You could have lost almost half your money, right? But if you're doing dollar cost averaging and every paycheck you're putting in steady amounts of money, then those little dips will actually be not as bad and possibly even better for you. Because again, you're owning more shares of stock. And then in the very long term, those shares of stocks will continue to grow, right? So this is a average price chart with dollar cost averaging. These little red dots are when you actually purchased the um, stock in question here. And as you can see, there's quite a bit of peaks here. You're not going to buy that many shares of stock when it's really high. But then in these low points here, you're actually going to be buying more shares of stock. And then the average price will be affected with that, right? So you don't have to time the market and thinking, okay, we might be at an all-time peak. So I'm going to wait it out and not put any money in for another year. Maybe 2022 will be another 15, 20% gain for the year for all we know, right? Um, If you decide to put in all your money here, it might continue to go down, right? So I recommend doing dollar cost averaging and consistent payments every month. Any questions on dollar cost averaging? 
Yeah, so for sure, dollar cost average and something I've really started to do with Bitcoin uh, recently. Uh -huh. I think it, it helps de-stress from, you know, buying, you know, 50 grand's worth all at once and then seeing it go to, you know, half <laughs> yeah. and lose half of it in an instant. So I'm, I'm really trying to focus on dollar cost averaging into Bitcoin um, because it's just so stress-free, right? Just buy a few hundred here, a thousand here. Don't uh -huh. worry whether you think it's at all-time highs. Don't, you know, just don't worry about it. Just keep adding little bits over and over. Anybody watching, do you guys do any Bitcoin um, averaging in? Or DC Melman has a question. Let's put it up. Um, it says, if you have capital available in your investing account, would you hold it in reserve in order to DCA, dollar cost average, into things? Good question. Um, if you're just starting out and you have a pretty sizable amount of money just in savings or in checking account, um, I usually would recommend to start with a certain percent of money and put it in now, maybe 25% now, and then put another maybe 5% every month or two until you hit the 100% instead of necessarily putting it all in at once. Now, you don't know which one will be better off in the end. Maybe we're at a low point right now in the stock market and putting it all in at once would have been better. But I think just slow sizing it in would be a little bit preferred where you could probably put the whole thing in within six months to a year or so. Yeah. For me with Bitcoin, I'm not really putting like a limit on it. I'm just doing it indefinitely. So I'm not like, I'm not planning anything. I haven't sat there and gone, okay, I've got 20,000 to put into Bitcoin. I, I don't have any like reserve funds, especially for dollar cost averaging. I'm just doing it. You know, it's yeah. not, that much Which again, in the, in the long run, Bitcoin does well, you know, 20, 30 years from now. That's going to be a very strong strategy to do. Just keep buying every time you could, right? Right, right. And you get, I think you get rewarded on Coinbase and things for that. You can set up a recurring thing. I don't know if it's the same. I've never done it on like longer term stocks. Is there mm -hmm. a, an incentive thing on anything like that for doing it um, with stocks? I know with, with Coinbase and Bitcoin, you can set up a recurring thing and you get rewarded for dollar cost averaging essentially. I've heard of I've heard of some companies that might encourage doing it by putting in a little bit of a bonus in, but I, I don't personally do it that way. So I'm not sure. There, there might be one. Any other okay. questions? No, nope. nothing else being asked about dollar cost averaging. Okay. All right. So I want to go over some of the main strategies to work with where you're actually trying to put in your money. Okay. So dividend growth companies is one of the strongest ways that I would say almost foolproof, especially if you're looking at a very, very long time horizon, is one of the best ways to grow your wealth over time. It's not going to start very quickly, but with the power of the numbers that you're about to see, and if you look at the time horizon that we're looking at, it's a very strong strategy, okay? So when companies, let's say they have a strong moat and they're you know, captains of their industry, right? Even Apple, for instance, they typically will pay out dividends. And this is money that goes back to shareholders, and they typically will increase these each year. So when a company is making a lot of profits, there's essentially three things they could do with it. They could either take that extra profits, put it back into the company to make the company more valuable. Those are the growth stock companies, you know, Amazons and Teslas and whatnot. They don't pay any dividends at all. It's still possibly a viable strategy. Another one is they could buy back shares of stock. Um, if you look at certain companies, they are very aggressive in buying back shares. Uh, there was one that came to mind that was insane is taking like five to 10, I think Google is one of them, that they're buying an insane amount of shares back. So what happens there is if there's less total shares available, the shares that you own, you actually own a higher percent of the company that way. Um, and dividends is a third way where they literally just pay you a cash payment and those payments will continue to grow over and over. Okay? When you reinvest your dividends, that's where your power comes in. Um, again, I'm, we're looking at companies that are very stable, but they're going to be growing their dividends over time. The current yields, the current payouts is not going to be very dramatic. Like it's kind of boring seeing, oh, I just made a half a percent dividend payment in three months, right? But if you're looking at these companies and then reinvesting them back into more shares of the stock, you benefit in three different ways here. You obviously benefit from the dividend payments that are coming in. 
then you're going to be getting increasing dividend payments in the future. I like to invest in companies that have a long-term track record of improving their dividend um, payments every year. And then the dividends will be being paid with more shares of stock. Because as you take those dividends that you collect to buy more shares of stock, you're getting those increasing dividends. Okay, It's almost like you take a little seedling for a tree and then you got to water that tree, right? You dollar cost average, you keep putting in, you know, a little bit of sunshine, a little water over and over again, right? And then that tree will start to grow more leaves. Those leaves will grow other branches into more leaves. And then eventually you might have a really strong apple tree that provides you apples over and over again, right? What can you do with those apples? You could eat the apple right away. It's just like a dividend. You could take your money and buy whatever you want with it, right? Or maybe you could take those apples, take the seeds in the apple, try to grow more trees, right? And then those trees will continue to grow more branches and more apples. And then you become Johnny Appleseed. This is a stock chart of the S&P 500. They broke down the index into different types of companies. We have dividend cutters and eliminators. These are ones that had dividends and they got rid of them. That's the low green line. And from 1972 to 2017, it essentially broke even. We have dividend non-payers. They decided they're not going to pay a dividend at all. And again, this is the average of all of them. Some might do okay, some might not. But as you see, non-payers, decent return, but not great. No change in dividend policy. That means they kept their dividends the way they were forever, or in this, at least this time period. And that's starting to increase because these are dividend payers, but they're not growers. And then we have equal weighted S&P 500. That's just every single company in the S&P has a pretty good return there. But the two that you want to focus in blue, the dividend payers, um, I got to look more into what the difference between the dividend payers and no change in the policy was. I'm not sure exactly what the non-change was, but dividend payers are ones that are showing that they're going to take some of that money that they make from profits every quarter, pay them back to stockholders. And you can see that that was one of the highest. But the highest one of all of them were dividend growers and initiators, companies that didn't have a dividend. They decide we're going to start paying a dividend and companies that already had a dividend and they're going to pay bigger dividends over time. And as you can see, the chart speaks for itself. Um, one dollar is eight thousand two hundred sixty-seven dollars from seventy-two to two thousand seventeen. So, as, as you can see, just breaking down the S and P five hundred into those dividend companies, um, there's a lot of reasons why this might be true. One is as dividend as companies provide a dividend, they want to usually make sure that they're paying at least the same amount, if not more, because shareholders don't like it when companies cut a dividend. It's showing that there might be signs of weakness in the company. And also by increasing the dividends, stockholders in general like these companies more. So the share price in general goes up as well. This um, shows the dividends and stock price of Visa. So Visa, if you look at this chart here, they started paying their dividend in 2008. And it was only three cents a share every three months or each quarter. Again, you're not going to get very rich from the dividends of Visa, right? However, the last dividend payment on November 9th paid 38 cents. That's over 12 times the original dividend payment. So again, if you bought shares right here in 2008, you're going to earn 12 times your dividend payment just from that one share of V that you owned in 2008. We're not even including um, reinvesting those dividends into more shares of V. Because you can imagine this one share of V might be two shares here, three shares here, four shares here. And then all those shares of V are paying more and more money, right? Um, I had another chart showing Visa stock price. And it's actually pretty similar to the dividends. Like there are bumps in the radar there. But Visa has been a very good just capital gain stock as well. So that's something to consider. As your dividend history improves, usually the stock price goes along with it. All right, so I did mention what dividend company do I want to share with you guys for 2022? And the company I like to talk about is Realty Income. Some of you guys might have heard of it before. 
It's a very popular REIT, which is a real estate investment trust. If you're interested, you can buy it. It's a ticket symbol is just O. The dividend track record is one of the best dividends I've seen in any company around. They've made 617 consecutive, that means every month, not quarter, um, dividends. Since 1969 to today, they have always paid a dividend. Not only have they always paid a dividend, they've increased their dividend 114 times. Just imagine if you were in 1969 buying that share of realty income and it grew 114 times for just your dividend. It also paid 97 quarterly increases. They typically increase it once every three months or every quarter. So you could look forward to getting a little bit extra payment in the dividends every three months. The dividend growth has been 228%. And the average growth rate every year of just the increase of your dividend was 4.5%. And that's very good, strong company. So any questions on dividends? Uh, so there was a couple of questions. I'm going to go back. Just one. It was again from DC. I'll just put it up. So have you looked at seasonal cycles at all and determined any better time to more heavily weight buying over time versus just holding cash when it comes to dollar cost averaging? So that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. I haven't seen too much on the data on that. Um, I know a lot of people say like October is a bad month to invest. Santa rally might be good now. Um, I don't look too much into those things because I know in the long term, if you just keep buying and holding and dollar costs, you'll be in good shape. Um, the problem with trying to time the market like that is one, you won't be receiving the dividends if you're in cash. And two, it's almost impossible long term to time when a stock will go up or down. Um, a lot of the data show that it's very hard to, to make any difference on that. It's almost like throwing a dart in a dartboard. Right, right. Um, and that's long term. I'm not saying, you know, week or month, but very long term. It's very hard to predict what's going to happen. Another DC Mel Melon comment. So he's saying he's liking these charts and stats. I believe in them, but I struggle with how to distribute my funds. Buying 100 shares of something like V is very expensive. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm going to go over the strategy that I use with my kids, actually, and how we make it a very easy way to, to deal with that. So I'll go over that a little bit more later. Okay, cool. Um, I think uh, Carrie just mentioned that that you could try using a broker that lets you buy fractionally. That's uh, that's one of the strategies we're going to do, yeah. All right, cool. Okay, I think, think we're good to continue. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, so... With Realty Income, I did mention in the comments on Facebook, I bought this stock, right? So it was $71.92 a share. I bought 41 shares of this, which cost me 41 times $71.92, $2,948.72, okay? The dividend currently per share is a quarter. So I'm getting a quarter dividend times 41 shares every month. This is a monthly payer. There's some right. monthly payers. Most of them are quarterly payers. Okay. Dividend yield right now is 4.26%. The last five years dividend growth rate is 3.5%. So that means this yield will possibly go up because of the dividends going up. But also another thing I forgot to mention, um, the dividend yield usually stays relatively stable. But when the dividends grow, the stock also tends to go up too. So the yield definitely depends on the stock price for that. Um, my approximate annual dividend payout will be a quarter times 41 times 12 months in the year. So I know right now I'm going to be getting about $123 in dividends next year just from simply holding this stock. Okay, I didn't factor in the reinvestment of dividends, which I plan on doing as well. So when I'm making my about $10 a month or so, that's going to be buying fractional shares of more realty. I'll get another point one something shares per month, right? Um, this is a spreadsheet that I'm going to give to any members that might be interested in following my newsletter, by the way. I'll always be putting any positions that I buy, number of shares, costs, and there'll be articles explaining why I actually picked those positions, okay? This is Realty Income's annual dividends. Love those increasing bar graphs, right? 
1994 paid 90 cents a year. Right now we're at $2 and 96 cents a year. Okay. One of the main goals, find companies that grow their dividends consistently. And this is as consistent as you could get. 2020 COVID hit. That was not even a bump in the radar. See, it just kept going up. Right. And a lot of companies did cut their dividends in COVID. They're starting to bring them back. And a lot of them are getting back to the levels of 2018, 19, but definitely like to see those companies that have a very strong track record. Right. Yeah. Um, this one I just posted today, AVGO, which is another um, company I, I do own. They are Broadcom. They make the Wi-Fi chips and other technology for your iPhones, among a lot of other products. Their dividend growth rate has been incredible. 2020, they paid $3.25 a share. They just this quarter raised their dividend again up to $4.10. So again, owning this company, you made almost an extra dollar a share in a year, right? We want to be looking for these companies that consistently grow their dividends, right? So Any okay. questions on these? Yep. So Kerry asks, so if you buy and hold, your dividend yield goes up, right? The, the yield on cash that you start with would go up. The dividend yield depends on the share price of the stock and the dividend received. So just to keep the numbers simple, let's say a company is $100 a share and it pays $1 in dividends. You do one divided by 100, it'll be 1% yield, right? Now let's say that they increase their dividend to $1.40 because they made so much money. If you do $1.40 divided by the $100 share, you're going to get 1.4% yield, right? So it's a higher yield there. But what tends to happen is, again, people like seeing these dividend increases. They tend to buy the stock when that happens. And the share price could be up to, say, 120, 130. So the yield may not necessarily change that much. Um, a, lot of, a lot of what you want to factor in is not the current yield, but what will that yield be paying steadily over many, many years and decades? Right. And the question I have is, so I did some monthly dividend investing stuff, and maybe I just don't have the patience for it. But what I'd find is the dividends would be great, right? You get a nice little payout, you know. Uh -huh. But the stock price would keep going down and down and down. And I'd just be like, okay, this isn't actually overall that helpful. <laughs> were, you doing, were you doing relatively short -term. high yield dividend stocks? Was I doing high yield? Yeah. It was yeah. monthly, monthly dividend stocks that I was doing. I don't remember what the – Exact factors where I just picked a handful that seemed like. <laughs> yeah. do, you, do, you remember if, do you remember if the yield was pretty high when you bought them or relatively well, low? Probably high. I think it was pretty high. Yeah. Yeah. So very think, high yield, the very high yielder ones. And I do know a lot about them. I have invested in them too. They're not necessarily bad or good, but if they're not able to sustain their dividend and they cut dividends, which tends to happen a lot. Again, investors don't like lower dividends, so that drives down the stock price. Right, a lot which is long-term buy and hold that we're going to recommend are going to be in the like two to five percent or so dividend yields. Yeah. Again, not which a ton why, of them right now, but very stable companies that grow over time. Just why I'm relying on you for this information because I think um, you know, the marshmallow experiment that they do with yeah. kids, like <laughs> <laughs> one of the people that grabs the marshmallow, yeah. <laughs> um, where you seem to have that longer term focus, which is why I'm referring all these questions to you yeah. because I'm terrible. Anything takes more than a one minute chart I can cope with. <laughs> Anything else? These are right. These are relevant questions, and a lot of people do get tempted by those high dividend yields. Um, yeah. There's a ETF called QYLD that they sell covered calls off the triple Qs, and it pays yeah. a high yield. It's like. 12 yeah. to 14 percent a year and just dividend which is not really a dividend it's really return of principal but that's a whole other story but when you right. look at the share price it hasn't done anything and you would right. have been better off just owning qqq in the end yeah all right we have another question from dc right. again what do you use to screen for these stocks what criteria are you looking for it sounds like dividend aristocrats list but do you have a minimum dividend yield that you're looking for Good questions. Um, there's not one particular avenue there. Um, th I did write a lot about that in the ebook. Um, if you join the newsletter, 
in terms of what I look for. The quick answer to that are, yeah, aristocrats are very good. They're a very long-term track record. You could look at the Dividend Kings and Challengers. They're, all these names are just the amount of years that they grew their dividends. So that's one place to start at. Another main one I like to look at is their payout ratio. So are they paying a large amount of their profits back to shareholders or are they a pretty reasonable amount so they could still grow? If you see a company with a payout ratio of like 50%, 70%, you start to get a little uneasy on that because from one quarter to another, they might have some bad seasonality there and then they won't be able to increase the dividend. So yeah. I tend to look for payout ratios around 20 to 40% or so, give or take. And, nice. and there's a few other avenues there, but I won't have time to go over all of that. Okay. Um, so there's, Kerry says he owns uh, QYLD. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a question, it's just a statement I thought I'd put up. Matt's here, he says, sell covered calls to mitigate the downside on dividend stocks, which I'm pretty sure is part of your strategy, Lance, which you're probably yes. going to talk about. Later it is, stuff. and we might, we might meet a second time to talk about that one, because it's a little right. bit more detailed. But um, yeah, the QILD and also selling covered calls is part of the main strategies that I'll be talking about on the newsletter. Yes. All right, sounds good. Well, there's no more questions at the moment, so let's keep going. See All right, got. next thing I want to look at are asset classes in terms of what might be good general trends. So before, uh, let's let's go over what an asset class is. Essentially, you can invest in small type companies, small cap comp companies, or you can invest in large cap companies, right? Um, and that has to do with the market capitalization, how big the number of shares are type times the share price, right? So you could that's one avenue, right? Bigger or smaller. And then you could have value type companies and growth type companies. I talk a lot about this in the ebook um, if you join, but essentially value companies are a little bit more beaten down. They might be the more boring, you know, waste management. They're cleaning up trash and stuff, but they have really good long-term track records. The growth companies tend to not pay dividends and they have high PE ratios and investors are expecting them to continue to grow at, those high rates. If, and this is just a table here that you'll see each decade from 1930 all the way to 2019. And then they're color coded. So we have government bonds, small cap blend B is a blend of value and growth. We have treasury bills, S&P 500. Four, con four fund combo is essentially the small caps and the large caps together. And then you have small cap value stocks and large cap value. So when you're looking at this chart, you're not going to really see much specific trend that always works out, right? One decade, you might have small cap value in, and then the next one, it might be in the middle, right? S&P 500 could have some good decades and then some down decades, right? 2000, 2009, S&P 500 actually lost you money for a whole decade. But then the last decade, it came roaring back, right? However, when you look at all of this data in the last column here, we're taking the average of the 89 years of data and small cap value is the largest asset class that beats the other funds. That's not to say that one year or even one decade, small cap value will beat out any of the others because it could lag behind. But in the very, very long term, Small cap value does beat all. So that's why I recommend to have a small tilt of a little bit more small cap value than other asset classes. I'm not saying to not invest in S&P 500 or value stocks that are large, but you might want to consider putting some funds into your small cap value stocks, okay? So this chart is a very useful chart, again, that shows all different asset classes, you can't predict what's going to be better or worse, right? Looking back at decades, who's going to know what's going to happen in the next decade, right? Yeah. Um, here's some other data that I actually figured out from that chart. So the S&P 500, it's a very common, um, you know, SPY ETF. The best 20-year period for that index was 1980 through 1999. You made almost 18% per year which is incredible, right? The worst 20-year period, though, the return was 6.5% per year. Again, not 
horrible, but still 6.5, right? Not great. The average was 11.6, okay? So let's consider these numbers of the S&P 500. Now let's look at small cap value. The best 20 years was 77 through 96, 24% per year for 20 years. But here's what I find interesting. Even the worst 20 years, 55 to 74, you still made 9%. S&P 500 was about 6%, right? The average return was 16.7%, which was 46% as a just total dollar amount better compared to the S&P 500. And then probably the best fact I saw of all of these, when you look at the 61 20 year periods, so they're looking at 77 through 96, 78 through 97, and so on. There were 67 total periods. Small cap value beat S&P 500 60 of 61 times. So again, very, very long term. We're looking 20 years here. Small cap value is doing quite a bit better than S&P 500. And that's not to say not to invest in S&P 500. I do believe in diversification, owning a lot of different asset classes, a lot of different companies. But having a little bit extra in small cap value is what I've been doing for at least the last 12 years now. And I continue to expect to do that until well into retirement. Questions? Um, so no, any questions so far? I think uh, Carrie just mentioned... He did buy a small cap value ETF this morning. <laughs> yeah, which one was it? It was yeah. this one, Vanguard. Oh, yeah. Um, I do SLYV, which is not Vanguard, but it's another one that's similar. I forgot what Vanguard's is. It's at, um, ah, I forgot at the top of my head. I, I did look into it a few years ago. There's, IKR, there's, there's a few of them. I'm liking this new function where I can put stuff up on the screen, but you're missing out on it. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> um, all right, cool. Well, let's move on. Um, let's see what else we've got um, to go over. That's, that's all. That's all I really had planned in terms of long-term stuff for now. But we could meet again in a few weeks if any yeah. other questions. I could go over covered calls, but I don't want to leave this too long. Um, cool. Essentially, what we're doing is uh, I'm going to do a long-term newsletter here. It's going to be a bi-weekly newsletter. I'm going to be emailing you my thoughts on the market, watch list of stocks to consider for these long-term buy and hold strategies, and also for dividend growth companies. We'll also go over conservative covered call options where you're most likely going to keep your stock but get a little bit of extra income and different sectors to add to at different times, right? We're also going to look at the buy and hold strategy guide. I wrote about a 35-page, very condensed and detailed version of this presentation with other um, covered call strategies, sample portfolios for different um, age groups if you're at retirement, before retirement. If you sign up, I'm gonna do a one hour, just one-on-one -on -one Zoom with you, and I'll go over what your current positions are, if you have any. If you don't, we could come up with a just reasonable way to start your portfolio here. We'll go over your asset allocations if you like, if you're too heavily weighted in one or another give some recommendations on how to improve. And again, or start from scratch, okay? Also, we'll look at different sample portfolios for investors in different stages of life, younger investors, near retirement, after retirement. I will let you know anytime I buy any of these buy and hold um, stocks. And you can email me anytime with any questions, okay? So the total value for this, uh, if you add it all up with the time and amount of work to put up is about $1,050, but we're going to do this for an annual fee of $300. Okay? Yeah. It's actually $299 at the moment. <laughs> or a dollar there. Yeah, we'll change it to $299, yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, so, so go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say it's the perfect time. I, I know I'm tired of like just trying to chop it you know chop around in this market and part of me just wants to sit back and do what you're doing so <laughs> any more more chilled out uh, i posted the link to go and check out the landing page uh, in the comments so you guys can check it out but um yeah i mean you've been doing this for a while right lance this is you and you do it for your kids or your almost, kids 20, are almost 20 years now yeah 20 years so you've been doing this type of investing for 20 years your kids are doing better than i am from 
from what I saw in their portfolio. <laughs> was it like a, that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I thought it would be, I think it's a really, really good thing to add. And I think the, um, the one thing that we wanted to do is this M1 referral thing, right? Because that helps yep. reduce the cost for everybody. So I don't know if you guys so, know. Yeah. That. So earlier I did mention um, what, how do we invest in this? Because Visa is a very expensive stock, right? And you wouldn't want to just be buying one share or point whatever shares. So we use M1 Finance and I use this for my children as well. They're doing a really good promotion right now where if you simply sign up for an M1 account, if you deposit $100, you get a $50 bonus off, off of it for free. All you do is sign up with the referral code, deposit $100. Bucks. Now, if you decide to do that, we're going to make it even better for you. And we're going to take $50 off your membership. So all you got to do there is once you sign up, email me that you actually logged into your M1. These numbers will change. It'll be 249 not 250 right? Right. And then on the landing page that Russell sent is the code to sign up for M1 Finance, okay? Yeah, it'll be pretty good. So let me go over how M1 works and why I use it. These are my daughter's stocks. They have just been absolutely killing the stock market this year. That's a whole other side note. Um, I have my daughters decide on companies to buy. You know, they see a lot of Teslas on the road. They want to buy Tesla and stuff. And we're putting in, uh, it's like 20 bucks a month into this fund. So not a ton of money, but when you look at it, 52.8% this year, which is incredible. <laughs> this is the value over time. This is like the S&P 500 chart, right? Yeah. Now, what's good about it is you have different slices and you can put whatever companies you want in there and what percent you want to allocate into them. So these are some of the companies that they picked. Okay, You can easily do this on your own M1 account with the buy and hold recommendations that I'm going to give. You could do other stocks and ETFs if you like into it. And what's neat is you put the target percent of what you want. So if you put $100 in, Six dollars will go to Google, six dollars to Amazon, six to Apple, and so on. And it will buy fractional shares of all of these companies with just one click. And what's actually even easier is when you set it up on auto pay, you could literally just set it up one time and it'll automatically do this, put them in these companies, and you don't even have to touch anything. If I if that doesn't beat long term buy and hold and make it easy, I don't know what is, right? <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. Cool. Um, so again, we could recommend the different stocks here. You could do some small cap value in here as well. Put some S and P five hundred. You could put individual dividend companies. Um, for some of them, if you want to be more heavily weighted, you could do ten percent in one, five percent in another. It's very flexible in terms of uh, percents and what you want to do with your money. DC is saying he was going to ask how many positions do you hold in your portfolio and how many is too much or too little, but now I'm just going to ask your kids to pick for me. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well. Right, well there's no like rocket science here. They picked mostly growth companies here, but Home Depot has been killing it. It's been like 60% this year, and they're just, you know, kind of boring. Like they sell construction equipment, right? But they're a great dividend company, and their share price went up a ton too, right? All right, so that sells it then. The newsletter is going to be run by his kids. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I had to I, I had to lean them a little bit on Johnson and Johnson because they didn't they they saw the different shampoos and soaps, and then eventually my older one was like, "Who who makes these?" I'm like, Johnson and Johnson. They're great. My cousin worked for them for thirty years. And she retired with Johnson and Johnson stock, and she's pretty much living off the dividends. It's nice. incredible. They picked Kellogg first because they like the cereal. Kellogg's <laughs> has a good year too. <laughs> so um, I have a link that I can share in the comments. If you guys, if somebody wants to come on and say hello, um, it's something I'm trying to encourage more of is like to get more of people that are in these communities and the discords and the Facebook group to come in and join in on some of these uh, presentations, at least when we're asking questions. Um, nobody ever takes me up on it, but maybe somebody wants to, to come on and say hi. Um, love to yeah. like put names to faces and things. So here is the join link. If any of you guys actually want to come on, have your say, talk about bonds or trusts. Carrie, I'd love to know like what you do. Like you said, you got your stuff in a trust. 
Um, I don't know much about trusts um, and stuff like that. It'd be interesting to get your take on that. If you're willing to come on uh, and talk to us, that would be awesome. But if not, yeah. I don't think anybody will take us up on it. They never do. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> Matt will if he's still around. Oh, yeah. So right? I see the comments now. VBR. VBR is a good one. Um, I picked SLYV over it because it has a little bit more of a smaller capitalization tilt and a little bit more um, value tilt because the price to book value is a little lower than VBR, but VBR is perfectly fine. Yeah. Well, I think um, if there's no more questions and nobody wants to come on and have a chat about dividend investing or anything, um, I encourage you guys to go and check out the landing page. If you guys know, you know, with Theta Traders, uh, basically, I mean, you do a great job in their lands. Um, I mean, what's your win rate been recently? I've not been paying much attention, but I'm guessing it's still I looked, 98%. <laughs> I, looked at the, I looked at the whole year of spread credit spreads, and I was 84% which ends nice. up being a really good return. Um, just having an 80% return, you're going to do really well. Oh, we should also post the link to the um, the yearly deal. I think I still got it up somewhere here. Just in case any of the people in Theta are watching, there's still this deal that I'm about to post. So this is not the investment one. This is for Theta traders with the uh, cash-secured puts. Um and the spy trades that you started doing as well. So um, so we can do that for New Year, but then highly recommend just signing up for the um, investment stuff. Let Lance do all the work for you and send you the, uh, the information that you need. Uh, I'm lazy, so I'm probably gonna do that. <laughs> just let, <laughs> let Lance come up with the ideas. Uh, I, did, I just wanna reiterate for anyone watching, especially if you're Theta Traders oh. too. Um, oh. I do about half we have a guest. Time. We have a guest, he's coming uh -huh. on. Yep, it's Kerry. How's it going, Kerry? Nice to meet you. Hey, how's it going, guys? <laughs> yeah, not bad. Glad you came on. Um, it's good thanks. To... Yeah, thanks for the invite. Let me see if I can get you a better background here. Yeah. Uh, Seen yeah. plenty of pictures, pictures of you over the, the last year, but never never talked in person. Usually they're pictures like that with the... Uh... <laughs> yeah, that's 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 my background, right? That, that's the balcony, but it's too bright. I'm going back inside. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Um Quick question from DC before we continue. I'll put it up. Lance, what is your annual capital return on capital with dividend and separately with Theta Traders? So not including all your CSP stuff and all that, I'll I guess. To, I'll have to look at the – I haven't done all the year-end numbers yet. I know that the Theta Traders was around 27% for the total account value that went up this year. And nice. the, the dividends, I think – it was close to 22 to 24% for the year. Uh, again, I don't know the exact numbers on that, but I can definitely let you know later. Nice. Very cool. He so, did also, sorry for interrupting. He did mention how many positions do I hold and how many is too much or too little. Um, so how many positions? I do own mostly SLIV and AVDV. Those are small cap value for U.S. and international. And then I own about eight other just long-term buy and hold, uh, Realty, AVGO, um, Visa, MasterCard, Apple, and there's a few more like that. So I don't own a ton because I have a lot in the index funds. How much is too much or too little? It's really up to you. Um, I recommend having at least like 10 companies if you're only going to be doing dividend growth companies. But you should also be doing some index funds. Um, you can keep it simple and do VYM, which is the high yield Vanguard fund as well. And they do all that for you. Cool. Uh, yes, yeah, so I have a question for Carrie. Um, so the you were talking about your trust. So I've heard a lot about trust and things, but how does how does it work? Like what sort of percentage do you get to take out per year? Like what's the dealio with that kind of stuff? I did I didn't set it up. My mom set it up. So um, basically, I just I, I get enough to pay my bills. I, I get a monthly income that's enough to pay my bills. And then a, a, occasionally I'll get a I'll get a random disbursement that could be from a few hundred to 10 or 20,000 even. Um, and, and I think 
that's not based on the trust. That's just my mom deciding here. Oh, you go. Yeah. You know, okay, yeah cool. Here's some right there. So, so like for me right now with my, with my own, um, uh, investments, what I'm trying to do two things. The, the number one, I'm trying to figure out before I get the large lump sum that I'll get, you know, when my mom's not around anymore, um, uh, which is, you know, it's, it's a sad thing, but it's still something I have to plan for. Um, I, 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 I'm experimenting with different approaches and different um, types of investments so that um, if I lose money now, it's smaller amounts. And then, you know, not now, please. Yeah, that's my daughter, Taryn. She's she's a cutie, right? My, um, my daughter didn't come for this one. She was about yeah, to, and then got shot. Yeah, so, so so you get the point. It's like I I'm I'm experimenting now so that when I get the larger amount, I know where to put it, and um, I, I'm not going to make as big of a mistake uh, with larger sums of money. Um, yeah, and and and, uh, and then like I think you mentioned a long time ago, like. Uh, Playing the stock market is, is 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 a replacement for video games or something to that effect. And yeah, when I was younger, I liked to play video games, and I recognize that there's a similarity there. And and so I'm like, well, you know, if I'm going to invest this time in in uh, um, planning and, and executing strategies, I might as well have the chance of actually making money out of it. So um, uh, even like now and in the future, I'll have a, a portion of that amount that I want to be able to to play with. Um, and, and, you know, the goal would be to have it make money, not lose money. So so what I've been doing the last almost two years now is using the, the, the smaller amounts that I have available um, to test out different kinds of investments and different kinds of uh, different brokers, for example, like I have M1 and I, and I like it for buy and hold. M1 is one of my favorites, cool. right? Like I think Lance for, for, for some of the same reasons you probably came to yep. is uh, yeah. If I, if I want to buy a hundred shares of something that, that that's affordable, uh, I could do that with any, any broker. But if I want to buy a hundred shares of, of Amazon um, you know, it, <laughs> I can't do that right now, but I, I, right. I, I could make it a portion of my pie on, on M1. So yeah. Um, I, I like that, and and they're affordable. You know, it, it's free for the basic account, and it's 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 a minuscule uh, uh, annual payment for the for the uh, what do they call it? M1 the, plus. The, the I premium actually, or the plus? Or, yeah. I haven't done Then you have plus, access to what is it? Two point two point nine percent or one point yeah, nine? I get, forget. You could get yeah. really good borrow rates on it with M1 yeah. plus. Yeah. Yeah, so, so that's better than you could get, and, and you can use it for anything. You know, you know, like like you could use yeah. it to to pay your mortgage, or or you know, if your mortgage is more than that, or or if your car loan is more than that, you could use it to pay that down. So, they're 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 pretty flexible with that. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think this this opportunity has been good because it's allowed me to find it's allowed me to find a lot of uh, what's working and what's not working, and 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 I think what both of you have probably recognized is that some of it is. It's like what what's your preference i think uh, uh russell wants to see a little more frequent reminders <laughs> that he's doing the right thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he needs he needs a little more you know a little more uh um uh frequent intervals of success yeah. and and i think lance you, you you in general you've got a more patient um studied approach to 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 how to grow things and 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 those are both, I mean, you're both successful. So what I'm, what I'm working on is what works for me. And, and some of it, like, I think my, my personality might lean more towards Russell's side, but because the market opens at midnight or, you know, a little before or a little after midnight, depending on the time zone or the, uh, whether it's daylight savings or not, um, it's not realistic for me to watch anything. Um, so, so like, uh, you know, um, uh, a lot of the uh, the more aggressive strategies don't work for me um, unless I want to disconnect myself from my family's lives and be yep. up at night, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, even though, even though I like to see not, not necessarily immediate, but, 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 but more frequent uh, evidence of success, yeah. uh, I've become more patient yeah. um, because I, because I recognize both, my age and my my income wealth situation 
it, it is more of a retired person than than it is of somebody who's trying to 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 to, to grow fast. Um, so, so yeah. Carrie, we have somebody. We have somebody who wants to come on to ask you in particular a question. You ready? Sure. <laughs> All right, here he comes, Mr. DC Mellon. Hey, DC, how are, how are you? You may have to unmute, um, DC. I'm not sure how to unmute you. Uh, can you okay, hear me you now, Gary? Yeah, we can hear you. Gotcha. Okay, hey, yeah, sorry. My name's my name's Dean. Um, so in your trust, Carrie, how not to get too personal, but how much do you have to have in that trust to just collect that dividend income payment to, for – standard cost of livings, you know, in perpetuity, so the trust, you're not drawing down on the trust and it's holding its value. Yeah. It's over a million. Um, uh, but, but my mom has things pretty conservative right now. That's one of the things that I'm working on is uh, I'd like to be able to reduce the, the amount of the necessary capital to maintain the, the, yeah. So I think I can bring it down a little under a million. Um, and and with with still things that are fairly safe, um, and uh, that will allow us to, to to potentially use some of the capital to you know, buy a house or, you know, uh, if like travel because like right now where we are it's expensive to go anywhere. So you think about one person, it's it's it, it doesn't seem like that much, but for four people, like for us to go visit my mom, which we're planning on trying to do this summer, it's about twenty thousand. Uh, for the transportation and lodging, yeah, that's it. You know, <laughs> it's yeah. tough. Like so, a million, you know, a million that, doesn't get you pretty, what it used yeah. to get you these days. You know, so that would be like a once in ten years kind of thing. You know, unless I can get it to the point where the the capital is providing a little a little better. Yeah. Yeah. Are you drawing on that capital at all, or is it? Are you only taking the? My mom's drawing on it a little bit right now, um, and, and I don't have any control over that. And that's my goal: is I I want to get it to where I have like whatever our actual expenses are our annual. That capital will never be touched, so that like we can do more if we do well, or if we're creative or lucky, or you know the the, the situation allows for it. But we can stay where we are. And we don't we don't touch the capital. That's my goal. And uh, um, I won't know, you know, how how far we can go beyond that until. And this is the, that's the sad part. And, you know, until my mom dies and then I I control all that all that capital. So right now I'm yeah. happy to just let things be the way they are, because I, I hope she lives for my kids need grandma, you know, for sure. <laughs> that yeah, she's she's a huge, you know, she's a huge impact in their lives. And um, and what what she's doing now even if it's not exactly what i would be doing one she's alive and two it, it, it's it's paying our, our living expenses so um i can't i can't really i can't really critique it or um uh, complain about it at all you know yeah sure yeah that makes sense no that's uh yeah those are kind of my long-term goals as well i just like to have that baseline that just eventually is money in the bank that I don't see it. It doesn't exist, but it just pays me money eventually. And it, it, it has to be a certain amount of money that it's actually worth it at a certain point. Um, you know, so you're, you're what, what in your late thirties or mid thirties or mid thirties. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I would say, so you're still in the income phase. So I, I would say like, like, like Lance is, is, is recommending, you know, whatever you do more speculatively, a certain percentage of, of, of your investment income each month, I think, it's a good idea to put it into something that's going to grow um, fairly uh, conservatively, fairly predictably, and then um, y you can get it to the point, hopefully, you know, where it's going to cover. Aside from you know whatever work retirement you might have, um, yeah, it, 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 it it's going to take care of the the necessary expenses. I, I and I and I can tell you like that took a huge stress off and and the. Sorry, guys, I, I'm talking a lot, but 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 one of the things that I noticed is like like when I when I was a little bit younger, it wasn't hard to think, you know, to imagine like just going out and earning more. Um, but the body, the mind, everything, it, it gets harder. It really does. And somewhere it's different for everybody, but somewhere in the mid to late 40s to mid to late 50s, I mean, a few people just get blessed by God or whatever, and and, and they continue to be 
to be able to perform hours and hours a day into their into their later life. But most of us can't. And and uh-huh. uh, it, 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 it really it really like I, I, I like Lance, I, I've been working in education and I, when I taught college, uh, it was already getting a little bit harder at college because um, uh, I, I just couldn't deliver the, the the lectures quite as impressively as I could when I was a little bit younger. But but teaching um, K through 12, we moved here and I and I took a K through 12 position because my kids got to go to school there for no tuition and it's a great school. Um, so I'm pretty motivated to, to do it, to get them there. Um, but I just can't do the job, you know, just the energy required is, is just, it's just not possible. So yeah. I'm, and, and there is a college here, but it's, there's one and, and it's very small and with COVID and yeah, there's just, for me right now, it, I, online is about the, you know, something online is about the only way that I can, I can realistically earn income. And, and, and here is, it's a paradise in, in so many ways. And it's perfect for my kids. My wife is, is has a job. Where are you at, too. brother? I'm inside Dan. Um, oh. So it's a tiny island. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've flown out of Guam. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. So, yeah. okay. So, you know, and yeah. like Guam is, is I, are the difference from where, where are you from in the States? I'm from uh, Chicago. Chicago. Okay, so the difference from Chicago to Guam, as far as like people are nice and easygoing, <laughs> from Chicago to Guam, it's it's like that again going to Saipan. Yeah, I, I don't know if you ever visited here, but yeah. Um, so like for having uh, my kids are six and eight, you know, right now the way the world is, I want them here. You know, yeah. um, they're multiracial, and 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 that's one more factor where the U.S. mainland is is sometimes great and and sometimes just really rough for 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 people. And uh, so you know, here we've got clean air; people are easygoing. Um, if I can stay here, even though it means I don't have a job, then yeah, you know, sounds and, like a good and, life. Man. Yeah, most of the time it is, and and you know, we've got you know view of the ocean, and you know, the, my my mom is taking care of us. So um, you know, um, I think if you can get to the point where you don't have to worry about paying rent, um, that that should be the first goal. And so, yeah, uh, sure. cap, cap securing the capital, you know, uh, making sure that you're not going to lose money is is I think an investment is always the first priority, and then. Is it going to grow? And then just having a patient sort of long term approach for at least some of it, you know, and, and you can take a small fund like I do. You can take a smaller fund and try to be more experimental or more aggressive with that with that small portion. But uh, don't don't jeopardize the bigger picture. Um, that small portion might play out. And then, you know, if it's working well for more than a year, uh, because I think inside of one year, like I, I think there was one point in the year where I was up. 90 percent or something and then it you know last february a lot of those uh uh growth stocks uh <laughs> they took a serious dive <laughs> yeah they did yeah and you know i'm still recovering from that for that for that portion but all the other stuff that i did is is still thrive you know continue to thrive so like reits and, and real estate took off you know yeah. it, it took off late last year and and during the spring of the uh, of this year, it, it it took off big time when when some of those growth stocks were diving. Yeah, um, that's good, Lance. I, I do have a question for you. Mm-hmm. Um, the majority of the investing that I do myself, I have just in uh, kind of thirteen to fifteen different mutual funds across large cap, small cap, a um, couple dividends. Uh, dividend yield mutual funds, but they're all mutual. They're all mutual funds, okay. um, and I want to break into the kind of want to branch off into the dividend yielding stocks, and like Matt said, sell covered calls against them. But okay. I'm only working with 120 grand, so it's not. I can't. It's tough to buy 100 shares of really an appreciable amount of anything. Yeah. Sell covered calls against. Um, so. Maybe is it any within your recommendation to any screens that you would recommend uh, for screening for your, you said small cap value stocks, um, 
have the better historical return? Yeah, over very long time periods. Look at the small cap value ETFs. Um, a, a pretty decent recommendation is with ever all your mutual funds, you could go five to ten percent higher allocation in small cap. Um, a lot of a lot of the data shows you could also equal weight all of them. So do 25% in small cap value, large cap value, and then small cap blend, large cap blend. Do you, most of mine are in, uh, I think they're actually in probably growth mutual funds. Yeah. Um, you stick to the value ones though. Yeah, I lean more towards value. The blend has growth and value already in it, but the um, value is just tilted more towards it. Is the value, the value? What, what do you think of, uh, like if you go to, Go ahead. Sorry, what do you think of RYLG, RYLG and RYLD? That's the Russell um, equivalent. Yeah, they, of, we, we talked about cover, it on the, on the previous. Yeah. They do the monthly cover calls. Yeah. The expense ratios are high. It's like 0.65%. So that's going to eat up the returns uh, yeah. quite a bit. And um, that's true. I think yeah. you could do a little better on your own anyway, especially when you factor in that expense ratio. So that's why I do yeah. it. Myself. I was just thinking because the the per share cost was, was in the twenties that, yeah. you know, or thereabouts. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You could get a hundred there and, and, and sell covered calls on the covered call. Uh, yeah. But it pays uh, almost. ETF, which I, seems like I looked, at, down. I looked <laughs> into it. It doesn't, it really doesn't pay anything because there's, there's yeah. no open interest and in volume in that. It's like those Russian dolls yeah. where the doll makes another doll. Right. <laughs> so. um, yeah. Fact, that one's a little bit smaller. You're right. There, there, there aren't as many buys and sells yet. Like you said, volume. Right. Volume's not but as good on DC, that. Uh, but, have a little more. Yeah. Yeah. But DC, I would recommend M1 Finance because you could do the fractional shares. Instead of, yeah. you know, if you're putting 100 grand in, you pick your 10 to 15 dividend companies that you have good long-term track records you believe in in the future. And then you yeah. just set a percent to each one like that. Okay. And then you can leave the rest in mutual the funds. Do you see what you might also look at is uh, just do a Google search. There's a there's a, a tool that lets you compare a mutual fund to the most equivalent ETFs. And just if you look at like uh, um, uh, portfolio the cost analyzer, and the return, yeah, 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 yeah. It may okay. or may not like. I, I would think it might in most cases like ETFs are getting a little more like there's a lot more managed ETFs. For example, so they're they're becoming more equivalent to mutual funds, uh, yeah. but the cost is lower. So you might yeah. you might especially with a large, you know, if you have a large chunk in it, um, maybe you know, and you don't have to do it all at once, but make a plan for do I want which ones do I want to keep and and which ones do I want to migrate away from? Uh, yeah, to get better still, better overall. You still overall get dividend value. payments with ETFs? At yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, next question: How often do you go in and rebalance your portfolio? I've been I've been not very judicious about it. I want to say maybe every three to seven months I'll go in and punch it in my spreadsheet and you know rebalance it to the percentages that I have set. That's more it. frequent than most do actually. Uh, a lot of people just do it once a year. Once a year. No a kidding. lot of people do once a year. I think you're actually doing more rebalancing than you probably even need to in the end. So I wouldn't worry about that. Okay. Um, equal what kind of rebalancing rate threshold do you use? For what? What kind of rebalancing threshold do you use? Like if something, you know, something drops a certain percentage, another thing grows a certain percentage, you know, what? Where, I where's usually your... don't end up buying and selling shares directly because I don't want to take a short-term capital loss or capital gain necessarily mm -hmm. on it. So yeah. I usually yeah. just buy more shares of a yeah, lower buy more of the ones with, with the with the future payments that I bring in. Okay, and that's an easy way to just manually rebalance it. But I even don't do that too much. I, I, I think the fees associated with the transactions are going yeah. to be a big factor in that too. Yeah, really? with, with mutual to, funds. Some of them don't have fees and, and loads, right. and some of them have some fees and loads. And I've, so doing I've it often, been picking, you could lose. Yeah. I've only been picking Schwab funds that are uh, no transaction fee, no load. So I've been That's judicious true. about yeah. using only those. But um, yeah, I was just curious. On, ETFs on the and the, some yeah. of the ETFs are pretty much identical to mutual funds now, but you could get in and out of them during the day. Instead of a mutual fund, we need to wait until the next day. 
Yeah. It's not really a big deal True. in the end, but some of them are literally identical in composition anyway. Okay. Interesting. All right. Um, cool. Well, thanks for your time, Lance. Okay. I appreciate it. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, yeah, it's good to see you, um, Mr. DC Melman. Uh, I think we're going to jump on and do some strangle stuff at some point, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, at some point. Uh, you, some you're going to have to find me at a – it's probably going to be a short uh, – a short time, fully short thing now. Yeah. Because uh, uh, I'm I'm constantly I'm flying all over the place, so it'll be like sometime like today I have a full day available and overnight on one of my trips. But yeah, happy to talk about my up and down journey with strangles the last year. Yeah, it's been exciting to see you posting your stuff. And yeah, <laughs> it, to, was, uh, it was exciting until <laughs> October, then it wasn't exciting. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's wrap up. That's been what, an hour and 15 minutes. Longest one ever. So, there you go. Yeah, it was great having you guys on as well, though. It was, um, yeah, it was good. good. It was pretty good. So, yeah. All right. Thanks. All right, guys. Catch you in the discords. Cheers. All right.